our second speaker is uh, Purdue University Professor Emeritus in Plant Pathology. Um, he's been a researching minerals and soil-borne diseases of agricultural crops for decades all around the world, uh, and observing the crop fields of America and the changes in agricultural practices of our own soil and plants firsthand. He's a retired U.S. Army person after 41 years as Associate Director of the Armed Forces Medical Intelligence Center. Uh, he was part of an elite group of specialized world scientists uh, uh, post-World War II, and I believe he may be the only one in that group left. He carried out these duties while serving as professor at Purdue University. He continues work in our intelligence community where he actively participates in oversight security of biological weapons programs and threat pathogen concerns. He continues to publish, advise governments, and remains an international authority on the subject of plant and soil health. Last year, he gave 160 talks in 40 countries around the world. Um, his list of honors, if you go and look up his uh, resume online, is too large to mention in the hour and a half he has to speak. Um, he has uh, 11 children, 43 grandchildren, and 11 great, great grandchildren. <laughs> Dr. Don Huber. This is a mural in, uh, on the side of a cafe in Los Angeles, just kind of depicting some of the concerns that people have on genetically engineered food and glyphosate, some of the new technology. Have a grandson that's a surgeon there, and he said, when you come to Los Angeles, take you out and give you really good food at this cafe that serves only organic food. And uh, so we've had a good time as we've gone there. What we forget quite often is that agriculture is managing an ecology. That ecology consists of the four conditions. You have your plant up the top, you have your physical environment, and then you have this very dynamic biological environment, and in farming, we're trying to get all of those working in sync to support the plant. I have your pests and your diseases over here at the side, Hey, we want to make conditions as least conducive for those as possible. It's a system that we're dealing with. And yet what we find is that people forget that we're managing a, a system, and they're looking for silver bullets. And we've been using those silver bullets for a long time. You look in the, in the ads and the magazines, and it'll show you a bunch of stinger missiles for glyphosate or it'll, some other insecticide or, or herbicide, but they don't realize that we need to manage the system. Now, most people, as Stephen Covey says, most people listen with the intent to respond rather than to understand. He gives an example here, and he says that there are a couple of hunters out in the woods. One of them suddenly falls to the ground, his eyes roll back in his head, doesn't look like he's breathing. The other hunter panics and he reaches for his cell phone. He dials 911, frantically blurts out, blurts out to the operator. He says, my friend Bubba uh, is dead. What can I do? Well, the operator responds and says, you know, just calm down. Take it easy. I can help you. Don't panic. He said, uh, first thing we need to do is make sure that he's dead. And so there's a sharp pause. Operator hears a large gunshot, and the guy comes back on the line and says, OK, now what next? Well, it's kind of the situation we're in today. We've been used to having silver bullets. So when we have a failure of our, our genetically engineered uh, system, Roundup Ready resistant weeds or BT resistant insects. What's the first thing they say? Well, let's, let's do the same thing that got us into the problem to solve it. And so we add dicamber, we add 2,4-D or some other glufosinate into the GMO mix, and we start adding more and more toxins into our food. We forget that it's a system that we're really working with, and the consequence of this approach 
is that we have six soils, we have vanishing ecological support, deteriorating crop and animal health, and an increase in human suffering. If we look at the average annual use of glyphosate, it's almost unbelievable. This is before Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Just the use in, in agriculture, and you see it's not just GMO crops, pretty much used across the board. But the total use in agriculture is about a quarter of a million, almost a half a million pounds now, or, <clears throat> of, uh, or half a billion pounds for agriculture. That's only half of what we use totally in the environment because the Forest Service uses it, your parks and recreation use it, your home gardeners use it, all of your highway and, and utility right-of-ways all use glyphosate. So we're using essentially a half a billion pounds of glyphosate a year. In the U.S. Geological Survey two years ago showed that in many of our soils we have over two ton of glyphosate per square mile. Horrendous amount of toxin that we've just ignored all of its ramifications. The product, very simple product, as uh, Stephanie said, it's just a, a synthetic amino acid. If you look at it, it's first patented as a very powerful chelator to, steam, to clean steam pipes and boilers. Patented 10 years later by Monsanto as a very powerful broad-spectrum herbicide because it's a broad-spectrum chelator. All of our herbicides are chelators. So that then in 2005, it was patented as an antibiotic. It's a powerful antibiotic, but it's an antibiotic against the beneficial organisms in our GI tract that we rely on in the soil for nutrient availability, nutrient uptake, nitrogen fixation, all of those activities, but it stimulates the pathogens. The fusarium, the pythium, the phytophthora, the rhizoctonia, the cornospora, and the soil that are the problems that we've always had to challenge that are stimulated are in our GI tract the Clostridium perfringens or botulinum, the E. coli, the Salmonella, and all of those organisms that we have to worry about as being very serious health uh, factors. It's a very persistent chemical. I remember in 1974, a grad student coming up to me and he said, how long are we gonna have to worry about this chemical in the soil? I said, looked at it, and here it's glycine amino acid, Got a little phosphorus on it. Said every organism in the soil is hungry for phosphorus and carbon and, and uh, nitrogen. Said it probably last about two weeks. Boy, how surprised I was when we started doing some of those studies. And you find a half-life in a good soil is about 22 years. That's why in the CSIRO studies in Australia, and they started two years ago, started going out and sampling soils that in many of their good silt loam, silty clay loam agricultural soils, they can account for 100% of all of the glyphosate that's been applied to those soils for the last 20 years. There's been essentially no degradation. You'll see some degradation in the sandy soils and sandy loams. Very little in the clay loams, especially at the lower pH levels on those. It's a very unique compound. As a chelator, and all herbicides, again, are, are mineral chelators, but they're all very limited by comparison to glyphosate. It's a broad-spectrum chelator for any cation. A chelator is merely a chemical that can grab onto another element and change its structure or its characteristics. We use them all the time in food and nutrition and in 
agriculture to increase the solubility of nutrients, your citric acid, your malic acid, uh, glucoheptanates. A lot of those materials are all chelators. We use them, EDTA, as a beneficial. Glyphosate chelates and it immobilizes that nutrient then for all of those physiological processes. We have a lot of hundreds of thousands of enzymes in our body or in the plant. None of those enzymes work unless they have a cofactor available. Cofactors are your mineral elements. That's why we call them micronutrients. In general, you also have magnesium and calcium working in there. But it doesn't take a lot of them because they're the keys. But the enzymes, I've depicted up here as so though they're the engine that does the work. But the key that turns that engine on is the cofactor. So if you have a compound that can grab onto that key and turn it off or pull it out of the ignition, it shuts the physiology down. Maybe have a 200 horsepower engine out there that can get you from zero to 60 in your car in a few seconds. Doesn't do anything until you turn the ignition on. That's the same thing with these cofactors that the herbicides will chelate. So if you're using phenoxyprop or Tordon herbicides in the Pacific Northwest and across the Canadian prairies where we're short on copper, Ian Evans would tell you, make sure you're out there with five or 10 pounds of copper sulfate before you use that herbicide or you're going to end up with ergot and a lot of uh, sterility in your wheat and barley because it's going to further induce that carbon or copper deficiency that you're already low on. You need to compensate for it. Well, with glyphosate, it's a matter of compensating for not just copper, but copper and nickel and cobalt and zinc and iron and, and manganese and calcium and magnesium and all your cations, potassium and the whole works. So that if you just look at a pathway, we say, well, glyphosate or Monsanto says glyphosate inhibits only the EPSPS pathway. Oh, well, we know that it inhibits 291 enzymes at least because it's a broad spectrum chelator inhibits the EPSPS because it chelates manganese. Also inhibits the Raven 3 uh, acetohepulose phosphatase enzyme that's right up there by chelating cobalt. So in the lawsuit against the Monsanto filed against DuPont, DuPont's response was, hey, you patented the wrong enzyme. It's really the uh, Raven <coughs> uh Cetohepulose 3-phosphatase or 7-phosphatase enzyme that uh, takes priority patent-wise over the EPSPS. All of a sudden, the case was uh, sealed and it went uh, into a private session. They came out and announced that they'd settle out of court and there wouldn't be any dis further discussion of it. It would have nullified 1,100 lawsuits that Monsanto had won against farmers because they had, according to DuPont, had patented the wrong enzyme. But you can see all of those elements that are all chelated by manganese. Shuts the whole system down. Now, you may do it on a domino effect, but a very strong chelator for all of those mineral elements that you see in the system. You can look at photosynthesis. You can look at all of the other pathways, and you'll see all of those cofactors as critical elements as the keys for those enzymes. Doesn't take very much. At a 40th of the herbicidal rate, and we usually figure about a 16th of the herbicidal rate is the drift rate for it, but at a 40th of the herbicidal rate, 11 ounces per acre, it will shut down the uptake or reduce the uptake of iron and manganese by 50 to 80 percent. But then it uh, <clears throat> inhibits the translocation of iron, manganese, and zinc by 80 to 90 percent 
as far as movement into the rest of the plant. So tremendous uh, deterioration of the nutrient efficiency. So the crop may be able to struggle along, but it's not able to maximize its production efficiency in the photosynthesis. You can see that even in the Roundup Ready plants. There's nothing in the genetic engineering that does anything to the glyphosate. It's still a very strong, powerful <laughs> chelator for those micronutrients. So that you see a reduced uh, calcium, you see reduced manganese, manganese required for photosystem two. That's what splits the water to give you the hydrogen to combine with the carbon dioxide to form the sugar. It also interferes also with the regular photosynthetic pathways, and then you have iron, you have all of your magnesium that's involved in chlorophyll to capture the sun's energy, and you see that then looking at the product that we eat or that we're feeding to our animals in that grain, that product that we have about half of the manganese, have a reduction of about 26% calcium, about half the iron, so that our foods and our feed products then are much lower nutrient density. I give you a lot of examples of that, of what we see as far as infertility, as far as stillbirths, as far as uh, miscarriage and those problems. Well, glyphosate's been a very powerful tool for us as an herbicide because it's been very simple to use. Broad spectrum weed control, you squirt it at the plant. It's systemic so that it moves throughout the plant. You don't have to have good contact coverage. Moves throughout the plant and it accumulates then in the growth points. Those are the meristematic tissues. So in the shoot tip, the root tip, and in the reproductive structures. As it moves down into the, into the roots, and if it doesn't move into the roots, you'll never, you'll never see the plant die. It'll only be stunted. You can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil. So as it moves down into the root system, though, it shuts down the defense mechanisms of the plant to the soil-borne pathogens. Then as it moves out in the soil, it stimulates those pathogens to become more virulent. You have a plant now that has a bad case of AIDS. You've thrown highly virulent pathogens there, and within a, literally a few hours, you'll have more infection with the glyphosate-treated plant than you had, uh, would have with the plant in five or six days otherwise in that situation. As it moves out into the soil then, it also is toxic to many of these organisms that we rely on for nutrient availability. It changes the soil biology. A very powerful antibiotic against the good guys, but stimulates the pathogens. Some research we did in Guatemala on sugar cane. You can see that within six hours of application, you have more than enough glyphosate in those tissues to chelate 100% of all of the unbound cations that are in that plant. It continues to move then, but you can see what happens to the iron and manganese and zinc over there with that chelation. They just bought them out. You've pulled the key out of all kinds of enzyme systems so that it shuts those systems down. You see the effect in our environmental effects on nutrient availability, and so in Wisconsin and the high pH soils, same thing in the western calcareous soils, we have a disease that we call iron-induced chlorosis, or lime-induced chlorosis. What it is, is in your high pH soils, your oxidative organisms are more active than you're reducing, and iron is oxidized to the Fe3 form that's not available for plants. And so we recognize that, and that's one of the reasons why we have uh, iron 
supplements that are applied in Wisconsin. They had made a simple seed treatment, iron, reduced iron or iron uh, sulfate seed treatment, $1.60 an acre, and increased their yields from 33 to 56 bushel per acre. Very effective, very cheap, just overcoming that natural environmental reduced uh, iron availability. When they added glyphosate, they went from 33 bushel to 8 bushel. When they added their iron supplement, brought them up to 19 bushel, but it still didn't get them up to the 33 bushel that they had to start with. And the reason was they didn't recognize that glyphosate, not just chelating the iron, yeah, it chelates the iron, but it's also chelating manganese, zinc, and a number of other trace elements there. My research would have shown if that also had manganese with that, that it had their 56 bushel that they were getting over there. That added manganese to the iron supplement over there, they probably would have seen 65 or 70 bushel because they didn't recognize the hidden hunger that most of our micronutrient deficiencies produce. So that it's a broad spectrum chelator a chelator that is still very active in the Roundup Ready plant, and you can see the reduced lignin in these Roundup Ready uh, soybean plants. You can see the reduced photosynthesis over there. You see the re reduced nutrient density from the least e less efficient utilization of nitrogen, the formation of amino acids. But the other thing that you see is that it takes twice as much water to produce a pound of dry matter in a, a Roundup Ready resistant plant treated with glyphosate than it does in its normal plant. Not the way you feel the world with vari variations in climate change greatly reduces water use efficiency in that plant because it's a broad mineral chelator and it affects all kinds of things. Again, it's persistent. Our label says that if you apply glyphosate, safe to plant or safe to apply it any time before emergence of the seed. We see a lot of damage, a lot of problems in our agriculture because of that statement. In Israel, if you read the label, it says it's not safe to plant up to three weeks after you apply glyphosate because it takes a while for it to be detoxified by chelation. It's not degraded necessarily. It merely chelated and tied up so that it's not an herbicide, still reducing mineral availability. And if you look at those plants that are Coming through there, you'll see all the symptoms of nutrient deficiency. You see the tip dieback, very typical copper deficiency. You look at the textbooks, you'll see it. Look at the uh, gray green over there, very typical zinc and manganese deficiency, chlorosis. Going to show you iron deficiency, sulfur deficiency. What your, the plant is showing you that, but if you ask an agronomist what's happening in that, in that particular field, they'll say, well, you've got too much residue there. Well, yeah, it can tie up a lot of your nutrients, but or I'll say maybe it was too cold a soil. Maybe it was too wet a soil. Maybe it was too dry a soil. They don't connect the dots with the glyphosate. It's a very powerful, broad-spectrum chelator that is almost endemic everywhere you go. Now, when you apply your phosphate fertilizer, it will release the glyphosate, which is a phosphite, a PO3 rather than a PO4. And so in that release, then, you see it active as a very strong inhibitor of many of your nutrients even phosphorus because the phosphite will or phosphonate will antagonize phosphate so that you see a reduction even in your phosphate 
which is taken up as an anion, not a cation. But you see the greatly reduced efficiency of those nutrients. Then, because of this chelating activity, as well as the biological activity, antibiotic activity, that you have with this product. A lot of our farmers say, well, my crops don't look as vigorous as they used to. I'm getting a lot of calls from Canada. We've had three conferences up there and just this year already. Two of them for health purposes in animals, one of them for health purposes in their crops. Trying to identify and do the forensics on what the problem is. You don't realize that this 30 years of accumulation of glyphosate can come back to haunt them because it's not being degraded very readily and it's accumulating in the soils and what they're seeing essentially is just that desorption of the glyphosate that's been accumulating in the soil and coming back to reduce the root growth, nutrient availability and nutrient uptake in those systems. <laughs> Now, if you question that, this is a field in Georgia where he planted his pumpkins perpendicular to where he had his Roundup Ready corn the previous year. You have any problem finding out where the Roundup Ready corn was planted from the glyphosate that moved out into the root exudates into the soil? It was fairly obvious, both from the change in soil biology as well as the change in nutrient uptake. And it's a very powerful antibiotic, but it stimulates the pathogens. From Dr. Robert Kremer's uh, research at the University of Missouri, showing that 500% increase in fusarium colonization of Roundup Ready soybean roots, because there's nothing in the GMO crops that does anything to the glyphosate. It only stimulates the pathogen and the uh, EPSPS system from the agrobacterium tumefaciens, much less efficient than the normal uh, plant EPS system would be, so that it actually increases susceptibility. And you see that increase in the fusarium over here, but it decreases the organisms that would normally keep that fusarium suppressed. Your natural biological controls are very susceptible to it. Your organisms that are responsible for manganese and for iron and many of our other nutrient availability and uptake are very sensitive to glyphosate. So you reduce them. I mentioned you can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil. You can stunt it, it's a growth regulator, but in sterile soil in two weeks, when that plant recovers the micronutrients, those plants, every lateral bud will break and it'll take off just like you'd taken the chains off of it and uh, start wanting to grow again. Says, I've been held back and it'll take off growing. In field soil, where you have your uh, soil borne pathogens, your fusarium and rhizoctonia and pythium fusarium and all those organisms, then they've already colonized those tissues where resistance has been shut down and it's an end terminal condition for them. Serve on a threat pathogens committee and we have over 40 diseases now that used to be very efficiently controlled. We call them re-emerging diseases. They're re-emerging at the rate no longer controlled with our older mechanisms of control so that they're becoming now a threat to our disease, to our sustainability of our production. We have some new diseases in here. You have marasmus root rot on sugar cane meant that sugar cane, rather than getting eight to 10 ratoon crops out of a planting, they're only getting two and three. You have a pathogen now that colonizes that root system, but it only does it as a pathogen when it's stimulated by the glyphosate. 
when we came up with the nutrient approach for ripening of sugar cane using boron and molybdenum and manganese, we no longer have the marasmus root rot. And that problem, we can get back up into that seven and eight raccoon crop rather than the one or two. You see the cornospora and some of these other diseases, this cornospora root rot. Soybeans in the Midwest, I've seen 40% yield losses. It's a disease that 35 years ago, Scott Adney at Iowa State said, in, in studying soil ecology, he said, well, this organism's there, it's kind of a root nibbler on soybeans, but it's never, never been able to find it as an economic problem. Well, you see here, that's this is an inoculated, sterile inoculated soil, that would cause you five to eight bushel yield loss. It's a little more than a root nibbler under those conditions. But when you put a little glyphosate on those leaves, get that transformation, then you see a major disease problem because you stimulated the virulence of that soil-borne fungus to become a very serious soil-borne fungus. We have sudden death syndrome, didn't exist before glyphosate. Now it costs us a uh, million dollars a year. If you look at sudden death syndrome, we attribute it to fusarium. Not the fusarium so much, it's the chelation by glyphosate. Here are the symptoms of sudden death syndrome, here are the deficiency, or the symptoms of magnesium deficiency. XB uh, Yang at Iowa State University said, looked at those and he said, gee, that really looks similar. Wonder if I go out with a good seed treatment on my soybeans if I can avoid and essentially control sudden death syndrome. We've looked at all kind for all kinds of toxins and everything else from the fusarium. Had full control of sudden death syndrome by compensating for the nutrient stress that was caused by the disease. This uh, research field at Purdue University. You see the uh, half the field here has very severe take all, root and crown rot. If you thrash out those, those ears in your hands, all you find here is a bunch of trash and shriveled grain. Over here, you have a very plump grain. And the only difference in this field for the previous 30 years was one application of glyphosate over to where this red flag is. Doesn't match the platter row. It's goes to the flag. What happened was that our farm superintendent said, you know, there are a few uh, weeds showing up in that previous uh, Roundup Ready soybean crop on this side of the field. And he said, this is a, a show field. We can't have that uh, permitted. He said, screw up. And he said, there isn't any problem on this other side of the field, so don't uh, spray beyond there. Otherwise, it's been in the same crop rotation, the same tillage, same fertility, it's the same soil. And for the previous 30 years, one application of glyphosate changed the soil biology so that the guanamyces, root and crown rot fungus, which is ubiquitous to our soils, was able to have a heyday. Took out all the competitors, all of the natural biological controls that would have kept that pathogen in control. We see the situation with uh, Fusarium head scab, disease that is of concern not just from the yield loss, but especially from the mycotoxin level. And what Dr. Miriam Fernandez has shown in her research in Canada is that if you've applied glyphosate one time in the previous three years, you're gonna have a significant increase in head scab. If you apply it every year, you'll have about a 300% increase. If you use glyphosate on Roundup Ready canola, it'll be an in exponential increase from that standpoint based on the glyphosate that's applied. 
Andreas Tiedemann, two years ago at our National Fusarium Headlight Forum, said that it's no longer safe to use your bedding for cattle or for pigs or sheep because there's enough toxin now that's produced in by the fusarium in the root system, which we didn't have to worry about before. The fungus that causes fusarium head scab is also a good root pathogen. We've always had it. But now we're seeing that the toxins produced also in the root system translocated up, so your kernel may look very proper, very good, but it can still have very high levels of xaleron or the uh, deoxynevalanol trichothecene toxins. So that what he's saying is that you also now have it in the straw, so that it's not safe to use the straw, especially with the zaylerone, which is an estrogenic toxin, because it'll leave your animals infertile or sterile. Stephanie's mentioned the weeds. Well, this is a field uh, in Georgia. I'll show it just. You can see three years before, a few Roundup Ready resistant weeds there showing up. This is the same field three years later, of course, and it shows you why you have to have a GPS unit on your combine so that you can find your corn plant. <laughs> it's made it so that we have land now that they can't even find a farmer that wants to farm it. Or the banks hold the land, or big estates hold the land, they want to rent it out, it costs more to control the weed than they can harvest off the crop. And so they're not even interested in farming it. As uh, Jessica Sheffer has shown in her research two years ago with Bill Johnson at Purdue, Again, you can't kill a plant with sterile, in sterile soil with glyphosate, as she showed. You can stun it, you can drown it, and this was really dosed down in the sterile soil. But in the, uh, you're not, when we have resistant weeds, you're not having resistance to the chemical. What we've done is we've selected uh, disease-resistant weeds. So we have super weeds now that don't respond to our other chemicals. They don't respond, they're much harder to kill even with tillage because they're resistant to those soil-borne pathogens. But it's not a resistance to the chemical, it's a resistance to the pathogens. Well, there are a lot of food and feed safety concerns and Stephanie mentioned a lot of those for us. Certainly the reduced nutrient density should be a concern to all of us. That's where we get our minerals, that's where we get our carbohydrate, our protein, our, our fats, and all of the other vitamins and minerals have to come through there. You have the increased levels of toxic products that are now in it, both from the chemicals that are applied as well as the chemicals that are produced by other organisms by the microorganisms that are infecting. We have a lot of other factors that are involved here. You have the gene flow from the genetic engineering. They're very promiscuous, so it's moving. Then you have the direct toxicity of glyphosate. If we look at the nutrient density, you can see that impact of the glyphosate in reducing nutrient uptake and nutrient uh, Availability then with the, uh, you're not going to have any protein farms, you're going to have a 52% reduction in sulfur because as Stephanie said, that's where your, all your proteins come from the thionine and cysteine. So uh, you look at the manganese, look at your iron, your other reductions. Our food, a lot of empty calories out there. Research Dr. Jeffrey Sheffers, or Jeremy Sheffers, at uh, veterinary pathologist, University of Wisconsin, who spent five years trying to find out why he had, why they were having so many stillbirths, so much infertility. 100% of the farm calves 
were extremely deficient in manganese. The dams were extremely deficient. 63% of his normal births were extremely deficient in manganese, and so I looked at the feed. If you look at these levels over here, that high level that he was seeing was what we used to see as, as the average. Now that's the maximum levels that he's seeing. The lower levels, you wonder how anything could survive. We have the direct toxicity. These are the levels that, that the science says are way beyond the uh, toxic levels for any exposure to. These are the levels that the EPA says are perfectly safe. You say it's really interesting when you look at those figures, how come it's twice as toxic in canola oil, which can only have 20 parts per million, as it is in soybean oil, which is, permits 40 parts per million. What makes it more or less toxic in one, one product than another? Here you look down here at peppermint uh, top. You have 200 parts per million. We'll look at your other uh, uh, spices at seven parts per million. What makes it so much more toxic in one or the other? And then you realize that there's absolutely no science here at all. If you read the fine print in the uh, Federal Register, it'll tell you that they set these levels because the companies came to them and said these are levels essentially that we're finding in the products that we have to increase the tolerance levels to have quote unquote safe food. <laughs> and then they state the FDA and the EPA does no independent testing. We rely solely on the statements of the companies that these levels are safe. And you see the total betrayal of public trust that we've had. All you have to do is look in a maternity ward or look at the situation. It's not just for us. It's also for our wildlife. You see the typical effects of an endocrine hormone disruptor with glyphosate. You see the cleft palate. This chick's not going to, she's going to have a hard time getting out of the egg. Doesn't have a beak, it's not going to survive. Look at the underbite and the overbite, the inability to forage for those animals, as Stephanie mentioned, the tragedy in Yakima. They had invasive weeds in 2008. Government said, we've got to, can't tolerate those invasive weeds, started dumping glyphosate directly into the three rivers that go through Benton, Hamilton, and Yakima County, Washington. And in two years, you see the epidemic bed of anencephaly. We have two years' data because they quit reporting it. Told the medical personnel that if you report it, you lose your license because it violates the Federal Privacy Act. <laughs> Tremendous number of personal tragedies that are just swept under the carpet. You see that toxicity of glyphosate to the gut microbiome. You see the beneficial organisms that would normally control all of those pathogens so we don't have to worry about them. Those pathogens, most of them are ubiquitous in the environment. We don't have, haven't had to worry about them because we've had these good guys over here that are responsible for our immunity responsible for our protection against those organisms. And so as Dr. Monica Kruger has shown in her research on chronic botulism, that feed with one-tenth of a part per million glyphosate in it will destroy your beneficial organisms, your enterococcus and other organisms over here that would normally completely suppress your Clostridium botulinum and other species that can produce the botnerotoxins. But at a tenth of a part per million glyphosate in the feed, we wipe these organisms out, the Clostridium botulinum and perfringens and other species, uh, 
then produce the bot neurotoxin, and it's a matter of time before the animal dies. At the conference in uh, Winnipeg two weeks ago, I was at Dr. Ted uh, Dupemeyer, a 29 cases just this year of situations of chronic botulism where they were losing anywhere from two to three cows a day in a 300 cow dairy. We average in, in the U.S. in our large dairies about six cows a month. Now this very toxic to uh, animals and humans, we call this disease either chronic fatigue syndrome or sudden infant death syndrome. SIDS is Clostridium botulinum. Sudden or chronic fatigue is Clostridium botulinum from the toxin. We have the study of Flieger and, and uh, Carmen with the pigs from weaning to market, five months. You can see the irritation from the GMO proteins as well as the effect of the, the glyphosate in changing that microflora. <coughs> you can see the lesions, the ulceration in here, in the cattle. You'll see it in the rumen. You'll have a four or five inch ulcer. So that the rumen, the cud will actually drop into the true, true stomach before it's properly digested. It disrupts the system then in that area. The veterinarians here said that the intestinal lining was in such terrible shape that they couldn't even rate it on a scale. It was off scale for rating on the GMO feed, very normal in the non-GMO. With pigs, it's an ideal animal for similar physiology to us. This is what our normal stomach would look like. If you're consuming a lot of GMOs, that'll be more like it looks like. That's what you're seeing, especially with the inflammatory bowel type diseases. Dr. Dana Stanley, Central Queensland University, medical microbiologist, spent 20 years taxonomically dissecting that black box that we call our GI tract has 10 times the number of cells in it that we have in our total body. And she shows that when we repopulate with two specific organisms, we can eliminate autism, type 1 diabetes, and all the inflammatory bowel diseases. But glyphosate's toxic to every one of them. And unless you change your diet, it's a short time effect. You see other diseases that didn't exist before glyphosate and GMO crops, uh, duodenal necrosis in layers. You see the hemorrhagic syndrome in dairy cattle. You see the same thing in humans. I have two neighbors that have had 12 to 15 inches of their colon removed as a result of hemorrhagic syndrome. See all of these effects. You see the impact on our environment. You see the mortality to our bees, or three conditions with colony collapse disorder. You see malnutri malnutrition from micronutrient deficiency. That's because the bees are foraging on crops that again have been treated with glyphosate or the GMO crops that have less efficiency and less accumulation of those nutrients. You see the fact that the bees are starving to death because even though they have honey and bee bread in the hive, they don't have the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria in the honey crop to digest it. So they're literally starving to death in the middle of a bunch of food without that, those two organisms. It's an endocrine hormone disruptor. You, you tie it together with the neonicotinoid as another endocrine hormone disruptor common in the environment, and we don't, uh, the bees never learn how to forage efficiently. They can't make it back home. Don't have the energy, and you see this research of, of Amos, 2011, 
you can see that if the bees foraging on a normal uh, crop without the glyphosate, it just does uh, this just mess or uh, mix in the honey crop there as it's being digested and utilized, feeding the tissues in the bee. But if it's foraging on the GMO crops with glyphosate, can't digest that, so it's just a bunch of gravel that's in, and the tissue finally dies in. University of Wisconsin released a study this last summer stating that uh, glyphosate contributes one-third pound of phosphorus pollution per year for every acre in the watershed of Lake Erie. Well, what does it tell you about the chelating activity of glyphosate? Isn't it supposed to be poof and it's gone? Soil bound Why is it moving? It's moving because we've abused it, and indiscriminately applied it for 30 years. We've saturated all of the cation capacity of that soil. It's highly water soluble, without the ability to grab onto anything because it's already grabbed onto moves right into the lake. You see your algal blooms and you see your other eutrophication effects there. 2002, the U.S. Cattlemen's Association gave testimony before the Senate Ag Committee of two conditions that were threatening survivability of the industry. One was premature aging of the carcass. You take a prime carcass to market and it's graded down as though it's a 12 or 14 year old cow coming out of the dairy. The other condition was infertility and miscarriage. Two veterinarians took on the project of surveying all the dairies from Mexico all the way to Canada. And this is their report in the Hordes Dairyman, the November issue in 2011, saying what's happened to all our pregnancies. Well, you can look at these here, 47, 49, 48% pregnant, but then you look down here at the pregnant, those that are pregnant now, and there's about a 50% loss in pregnancy in a lot of those herds. You're not going to stay in a dairy very long if you can't maintain the, the fetus. If you can't have those calves. You look at the number of services that are required. That's time. That's lost efficiency. Our dairy, we average 1.2. We could have never survived if we couldn't have had better conception than that. And yet you see what's happening in the Western world where you see that fertility levels have, in the U.S. dropped 30% in just the last five years. You see the percent of functional sperm dropped 59%. So that we also have then the high rates of, of cancer and the other problems. So Newsweek came out with the article, Who's Killing America's Sperm? Or glyphosate. What else? And as Anthony Samsell was able to obtain Monsanto's own studies on cancer, at the same time that uh, they filed suit against the state of California, for listing glyphosate as a carcinogen. He was able to release the data from their own study in 1981 and another study in 1983. This is Monsanto's two-year study, suppressed, all sealed up until this time. Again, 23.8% of the rats developed malignant lymphomas. Zero in the control. Never published, wonder why. And then you have the independent study of Sarah Linney, his group at the University of Kane, essentially showing the same thing, as well as the kidney and liver toxicity from the glyphosate. You see the statements then of Dr. Miriam Copley, 
her deathbed letter to her supervisor at the EPA before she died from cancer. Uh, she itemized then in her letter to a, she says, we know of 16 pathways for cancer. Glyphosate stimulates everyone. It has to be carcinogenic. Then she says, maybe at this stage in your career, essentially I'll paraphrase, you can do something worthwhile and rather than changing the toxicologist report to favor the companies, be honest. Never appoint so-and-so to any of the, the panels because it appears she's taking bribes. And she goes through the other situations there. I mentioned that the, uh, situ that the uh, conditions in, or at the conference in Winnipeg a couple of weeks ago where Dr. Ted Dupmeyer gave the 29 cases that he was personally involved with as a regional veterinarian, where in every case where they're having severe death losses, as soon as they changed the feed, started to reverse the condition. Animal health improved when the feed was replaced, and within three days, to three, three months had completely turned the herd or the flock around, getting them off the feed, getting them back into a healthy, more nutritious feed. They added molasses. Molasses is a good carrier for a lot of micronutrients. That's your squeezings that, uh, where you haven't crystallized out your, your sucrose. Control the, eliminated the chronic botulism and uh, a lot of the other problems. These are what the livers look like in those animals that are receiving the GMO feed and the uh, glyphosate contaminated feed. And he did uh, glyphosate analysis for all of the tissues as well as for all of the feed. And you found anywhere from 580 parts per billion glyphosate in the feed up to six and seven thousand parts per million. He said, now I'm a veterinarian. He said, I see what happens to the animals when they're getting the byproducts of these crops that have been desiccated with glyphosate. He said, I can only imagine what's happening to our human population as that grain goes throughout the food chain. And we have very little analysis and very little check. This is celiac or Alberta, Canada, in children requiring hospitalization. And the reason I pointed out is not just the correlation with the GMO crops and all of it, and the glyphosate usage, but also look at the curve. That curve, as Stephanie showed, with Nancy Swanson's correlating the CDC data, fits all of these diseases. I've served on the Surgeon General's Quadrifartite Epidemiological Committee, and uh, when we would see a curve like this on a disease internationally, we would pull a scientific panel together and say, is it correlation or is it causation? If it's just correlation and not causation, what's the cause? Because you can't have a 0.9 or a 0.99 Pearson's correlation coefficient without being pretty close to the causation. It's never been done for any of these relative to glyphosate and the GMO crops. Yet they're the only thing that I know of that fits that correlation coefficient. We know that there are other factors that will be involved with them. Aluminum will be involved with autism, as Stephanie has shown. You'll have some other things, but you come up and you peak. With glyphosate, it keeps going this way. 
This data is all cast in stone for eight to 10 years in medical data. If we stop today, for eight to 10 years, we'll see that curve continue. We're in a major epidemic and on the brink of essentially a major, the greatest world depopulation that the his, in the history of the world. We can't continue. Alzheimer's disease, again, you can look at the commercialization of glyphosate, commercialization of GMOs where glyphosate increased five to 15 fold and I do consulting in Guatemala and other areas. And you see that concern that we have with end-stage kidney failure. One out of four sugarcane workers in El Salvador will die from end-stage kidney failure. That's 20,000 in Panama. We reported on an alternative to that. They needed an alternative. That's where we worked up the boron, molybdenum, and manganese so that we keep the plant producing sugar rather than trying to kill it, trying to stop it so that we can maximize the potential of that crop and we can get two ton per hectare more refined sugar with our system than we can get with glyphosate for less than $16 an acre more. You say, well, how'd we get in this mess? You look at all of the flawed safety studies and the fact that safety studies weren't even, weren't even required for many years. But in 1988, 1991, <laughs> the fraud was so apparent in the safety studies that were submitted that the EPA even took the labs to court. They got 20 felony convictions and free room and board for about seven individuals. We also saw about $19.2 million worth of fines, which was hardly a slap on the hand when you're talking about an $8 billion that comes into the company just from royalties on their GMO. But then you see from the data from that's being disclosed now from the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma trial in California, where all of the internal documentation and all of the emails going back and forth and the fraud in the studies. We have more scientific fraud involved here than was ever considered in the Neanderthal man. You have all of that situation where scientists were, good academic scientists were paid to put their name on studies that were never done. They were generated around a conference table published in scientific literature. One of them has been cited over 300 times for safety of glyphosate by regulatory agencies that was never conducted. Cost Monsanto $140,000 to do it. Total betrayal of public trust. You see it's continued right on. This is 2014. DuPont study, you find that uh, the control group, here's the control ratio, and you see that they're essentially fed the same thing as a test group. I think Stephanie would agree with me. I'd hope they'd find them substantially equivalent. <laughs> but I wouldn't consider it a valid scientific study, scientific fraud when we do that. What do you do when you're at this point? And the first thing to do is when you find yourself in a hole, you quit digging. There are things that we can do. Uh, put out five R's of correction. You have to recognize the problem. That's why you're here. Also, it would help if we had labeling so that we could remove the source. So we didn't have to guess how much glyphosate's in our food you'll find that whole wheat bread, which we think of as being much more nutritious because it has more of the micronutrients. That's where they accumulate in the bran. It'll have five to 10 times, sometimes up to 100 times more glyphosate because it's a strong chelator. We need to restrict the damage. 
We've lost a generation, literally. Now, Stephanie would tell you with autism, she didn't put that up, but you see that by 2035, one in two children anticipated to be autistic because those curves are cast in stone for eight to 10 years. <coughs> we have to remediate. We have to restore the system and remember that farmers have a responsibility. Agriculture is a basic infrastructure of our society. When you damage it, it damages everything else you're going to be able to do. Because our production agriculture determines how many doctors you're going to have, how many scientists you're going to have, how many school teachers, how many days vacation you're going to have. If we're doing it all, if we're spending all of our time just waiting on sick people, are people out of control, you don't get anything else done swamps the society as far as the greatness and the work that needs to be done. So there are things we can do. You can use alternatives. There's a tremendous alternative to glyphosate that's in the registration process now. I think it'll probably be available within 13 months, maybe seven months. The EPA's put it on a fast track. It's an alternative to glyphosate. It would be essentially all natural products and hopefully will also meet the requirements for uh, organic. It's going to be a little too expensive probably for broad acre use, but for parks and recreation, home gardeners, that type of thing, very, every bit as effective as glyphosate from a weed control standpoint. We can go non-GMO, that means said, go organic, it's the best we can do right now. Doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily be free of glyphosate, because there's been a purposeful, I believe, intent to contaminate everything that we have, so that we don't have a valid control for one thing. But we can look at ways to remove it from the body. We can analyze for it. So we have three labs in the U.S. that do a very good job of analyzing. If you want to find out how much glyphosate you have, the urine test is fairly accurate. HRI does that for $99. Uh, then how do you remove it? Well, it's Dr. Uh, Monica Kruger in Germany and Dr. Uh, uh, Dana Stanton. Stanley and uh, Australia have shown that humic acid and clinophilolite will remove it, purge it from the body. It doesn't pull it from the brain. Don't know of anything that will pull it from the brain. And the brain's one of the highest accumulation points for glyphosate. It accumulates in all tissues of the body. And Dr. Anthony Sansol of New Hampshire has done a really excellent job of showing that. There's some bio cocktails uh, with the probiotics going the oral route aren't very effective because it's hard to get them out of the out of the stomach. Dr. Stanley does That's hers where she can do it very specifically rather than a general fecal transplant is to condition the environment with kefir and yogurt and some of those things. That fermented products, and then very specifically go in to make those corrections, modify your gut microbiome in that area. You need to compensate for your minerals, your biologicals, and some of those things, especially in the production phases, and then restore that microbiome and, and the system and go back to managing that system. So some documentary books that have recently come out. <coughs> Mentioned two of those. One is uh, Stephen Drucker's book, Altered Genes, Twisted Truth, How the Venture to Genetically Engineer Our Food is uh, Subverted Science, Corrupted Government, and Systematically Deceived the Public. Really well documented 
uh, presentation on what's happened for the genetic engineering food showing the uh, fatalities in two weeks after <coughs> release of the genetic engineered l tryptophan 80 people were dead and 10,000 people are now permanently incapacitated before it could be pulled off the board. Steve does an excellent job. He's a New York attorney. He grew up on a farm in Iowa. Dr. Uh, uh, Michelle Perrell, his book's just recently out, he is a pediatrician. Says, what's making our kid, kids sick? Exploring the links between GMO foods, glyphosate, and gut health. Very well done. There are some others. You have Carrie Gillum. Uh, book on uh, whitewash. You have uh, uh, Tony Mitra's book on, on uh, poison foods of North America, where he takes that quarter of a million analyses that the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Authority has released, made available, indexes them, so you have all of those foods, and he shows that the Canadian foods are the most poisonous in the world. The U.S. are a close second to it. Some of the most uh, healthy foods that we think of, garbanzo beans or chickpeas, for instance, have the highest levels of glyphosate that you can find in any food. The reason is they use it as a desiccant. Any crop that's desiccated is going to have a lot of glyphosate because that's the only place that it, the uh, sink for it is still very active. And you have some other, uh, Stephanie mentions Zen Honeycutt's book on Unstoppable. You have some others that are coming out. These are uh, four labs. They don't know much about the Metrical Bio in Phoenix. Uh, they've just announced that. And they've been working with the detox project, so probably uh, a very excellent lab to work with. Health Research Institute, uh, new lab, state of the art, very excellent uh, personnel, highly qualified as all of them are. Microbinotech Labs, one that did the breast milk for moms across America, has done a lot of others. They use the Anresco, or the, uh, not the Anresco, but the uh, serological techniques, so it's not quite as active, quite as sensitive, but it'll get you down to half a part per billion, uh, which is about all that uh, Metrico and Anresco are, are getting. Uh, also with their HPLC, <coughs> but they can also do other food products and, and that for analysis. I'm probably over time here, but if I was to summarize, I'd state that uh, future historians may well look back right about our time, not about how many pounds of pesticides we did or didn't apply, but about how willing we are to sacrifice our children, generate <clears throat> and jeopardize future generations with this massive experiment that we call genetic engineering and the products that go with it that's based on false promises and flawed science just to benefit the bottom line of a commercial enterprise. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and Nigel and Joan, for your hospitality and putting me up, uh, all of you for being here, uh, giving me an opportunity to share. Thank you. <laughs>